Hey everyone, welcome back to Pig Prime. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. I don't know why I'm being so silly today. Let's get into the news. We have um, a bunch of stories for you today. Uh, this is some crazy, crazy stuff. We have Metroid Dread sales in uh, from Japan. We have Switch OLED sales in as well, although all things are not peachy keen because, uh, yeah, it appears that there is some controversy surrounding the development of Metroid Dread and proper credit being given to those who made the game. Uh, beyond all of that, we have obviously more sales for Switch OLED. Uh, we have issues on Nintendo taking out some music, which I guess the issue isn't so much that they're taking out the music. The question is on why Nintendo doesn't have better music availability. And beyond all that, yeah, we actually have some rumors that sound somewhat believable that there could be a 4K Switch late 2022 or early 2023. However, it might be next gen. And obviously that sounds a little crazy in wake of the release of Switch OLED. Before we get into all that, I'm going to remind you we are giving away three copies of Metroid Dread. To enter, all you need to do for now is be subscribed. Uh, I have a few other things that we'll be talking about later in the month here about how uh, how to particularly win these things. But you must be subscribed to win anything we give away. So thank you guys for that. And let's get right into the Nintendo news. So first up, we have a problem. Uh, Metroid Dread is obviously an utterly fantastic experience. The problem is that there appears to be a number of people who worked on this game that are not being credited. They are not present in the credit of the game. And this appears to be due to a policy by Mercury Steam. Now this article was written over in Vandal and is in Spanish. We are using a Google Translate. I'm just going to read this article to you because I want you to have the full context behind what's happening with Metroid Dread and why this is kind of a shitty thing, and I feel bad for those working on it that aren't getting credit. It says, Metroid Dread, the long-awaited Metroid 5 uh, that fans of the adventures of Samus Aran have been waiting for almost 20 years was launched on October 8th. Despite being produced by Yoshi Sakamoto, creator of the saga, the development has been commissioned by Madrid studio Mercury Steam. Several former employees accused the Spanish company responsible for titles such as Castlevania, Lords of Shadow, and Space Lords of not having accredited their work in the credit titles, thus preventing them from demonstrating their contributions to the Spanish title best valued by the specialized critics of all time. So basically just saying the game's really, really highly valued and they want to be able to reference their work on this game. And the best way to reference their work is showing accreditation and they are not giving credit for this work. That obviously can affect future employment opportunities. I would like to sincerely congratulate Metroid Dread Team for putting out such an exceptional game. I am not surprised by the quality of the game as the amount of talent on that team was through the roof. Um, it said uh, Robert Magus, a 3D artist, on his LinkedIn profile. I know it firsthand because despite not appearing in the game's credits, I was part of that team for about eight months. The developer assures in the final version of the title he has detected some of the elements in which he worked on. So he ensured that some of his work was actually used in the game. When playing, I have recognized quite a few models and environments in which I worked. So my work is there. So I would like to ask Mercury Steam, why am I not appearing in the game credits? Is it some kind of mistake? We have contacted Mercury Steam and a representative of the studio has told us that by company regulation, the credits of the game in the study appear with only developers who have stayed in the study. So have stayed, you know, programming or writing or artists for the game, basically worked on the game for 25% or more of the development time. The studio's policy requires that anyone must work on the project at least 25% of the time of the total game development to appear in the final credits. He adds, of course, sometimes exceptions are made when making exceptional contributions. Uh, MeGS, in an email conversation, argues that Madrid Studio is covering its back. They can always say that they consider someone's contribution to be exceptional and do whatever they want. A 3D artist points out that people roughly mention that it has been three years of production. Therefore, he would not have reached 25% development time required by the studio. I was eight months working there, so I didn't get to nine or whatever was required to hit that 25%. Another of our sources, who prefers to remain anonymous, points out that the game has been on the stove for four years, not three. In addition, he mentions that not crediting all the developers of a video game is common in all studios. It happens everywhere, and this source ensures that he has lived his own flesh on several occasions. 
Another different source who prefers not to spread his name to avoid problems. Again, these people don't want to affect future job gigs. Uh, who worked at Mercury Steam and was involved in the development tells us by email that he was working for more than 11 months and does not appear in the credit titles of Metroid Dread. Not accrediting the work of the team that puts all the love in the project and effort is a very ugly practice. Regarding the clause mentioned by Mercury Steam representatives, he comments a 25% issue sounds like an invented one to me that it suited them but well above the case, but neither 25% nor 1%. If I participated, you should put me in the credits. The other anonymous source neither affirmed nor denied that the clause was a rule to force within the study. Roberto uh, Mahadas, or uh, Roberto Meiji, I'm sorry, I know I'm butchering his name, but he's one of the developers that has his name out there, argues that his non appearance in the credits may be related to his departure from the company. Mercury includes a clause in the contracts in which it requires a notice of 42 working days. When they told me this, I investigated a little and discovered the workers statute in Spain establishes 15 working days as a minimum. So basically two weeks notice if you're going to leave. Mercury Steam requires 42 days, but that's not legally enforceable, right? So the developer says that he left Madrid studio to fill a position in another company. But that when he left Mercury Steam before the 42 days mentioned, they imposed a financial penalty. I know that they did the same to another colleague. He adds another person in a similar situation who did not give notice of, the, of his departure within 42 days notice required by the study reported in human resources that according to the collective agreement, it is only necessary to give 15 days notice and manage not to receive an economic sanction. Although neither appears in the game's credits after working on its development for 11 months. The 3D artist concludes, I have been listening to colleagues for years complaining about how people are treated at Mercury Steam. I was fed up with nobody doing anything about it. I hope that more people are encouraged to give their version. It's, it is common in all studios, I quote here. In September of 2020, the North American medium Kotaku, again, Kotaku sometimes has good work, uh, published on the article, how video game companies use credits to reward or punish developers. Among other figures, they mentioned that more than 1,000 developers who worked on Red Dead Redemption 2 do not appear in the extensive credits of the Rockstar game. Arcane Studios and Bethesda also didn't list everyone who worked on Deathloop, the first person shooter for PlayStation 5 and PC released. See, I wanted to bring up this point, obviously I mentioned that Kotaku article, because uh, I could have stopped at just the Mercury Steam stuff, but this is a common problem throughout the whole of the video game industry, and it needs to go away. This is not okay. If you did work on a game, and the caveat, that work is present in the game, you should be in the credits. Now, if you ended up working on a game, and your work ended up not being used, I can understand why in cases like that, it's sort of a um, a loss for the company. It's, hey, we hired you to do something. We decided not to use your work. Uh, you no longer work here. We're obviously not going to credit you because your work isn't present in the game, right? So in a situation such as that, um, I can understand not putting credit in the game because, hey, that's just a loss for the company. They paid you and, you know, they didn't use your stuff. But when the game is finalized and comes out, if your work is present, I don't care if you worked on the game for a week let alone 11 months, a year, two years. It don't matter to me. You should be present in the credits. That is a, like a bare minimum thing. A lot of gamers don't even read the credits, but the credits matter for employment purposes. You can prove, oh, I worked at Rockstar, but when they ask, oh, what'd you work on? And then you say, oh, I worked on this game. And then they ask for proof. And the only proof you can give due to NDA is because you can't literally share the work you did. You need, you know, because even when you make, made art, say you were an artist and you made concept art, Guess what? Rockstar, in this case, you know, for Red Dead Redemption, would own that concept art. You can't just use that willy-nilly. So the only way that you can get that a credit is to point out that your name is in the damn credits of the game. But if it's not in the credits of the game, that does affect your employment opportunities. And this is a problem. And it's sad to see that this has come up, in particular, with Mercury Steam. Now, we haven't heard this issue being um, touted by people who traditionally work at Nintendo's in-house studios. Maybe it is a problem there as well. I wouldn't know. There hasn't been any public complaints about it. Uh, but Mercury Steam is clearly participating in an industry standard practice that shouldn't exist. Now, I will note the 42 days noticing to me sounds utterly ridiculous. Imagine that you have a, a job offer, a better job offer that's better for your family, but you have to give a company, what, a month and a half's notice before you can leave? That, that to me sounds like there's a potential um, civil lawsuit or something like that that could occur, or corporate lawsuit or something, but I don't, I don't exactly know how all the laws work in Spain. Uh, I will say though that that just, does, that just sounds like a shitty thing. Why, why would someone need to give you basically six weeks notice that you're gonna leave? I understand that's more beneficial to the company, 
But um, yeah, the employee has a new offer. That offer might not be there in six weeks. So it's kind of shitty. So I don't know, something like Mercury Steam, as awesome as they are and as amazing developers as they are, and as much as I applaud you for your work on Metroid Dread, need to clean some stuff up. I think the whole industry has a lot it needs to clean up. And it starts, I guess, bare minimum giving people credit. And it really sounds like it's artists that are getting screwed because oftentimes artists don't need to be working on a game the entire time. From start to finish, you don't always need concept artists and 3D artists and all the stuff. You often only need them for a certain set amount of months. And that really gives them you know, the ability to disclude you from credits. And again, being included in credits is literally a big boost to getting future work. So I really hope this is something that gets sorted out. And I hope that this isn't a wider issue at Nintendo, although I won't be surprised. It is a wider issue in the rest of the industry after all. All right, moving on, we do have some positive notes about Metroid Dread. Uh, we have launch sales for Metroid Dread and it, it, it had 86,798 units uh, reaching the number one spot for last week in Famitsu in Japan. Uh, this actually would be a record. It would be the best selling Metroid game of all time in terms of launch sales in Japan. So that's really, really good news for Metroid Dread. Obviously, I look at 86,000 and go, that's significantly less than a lot of other Nintendo games. But we have to keep Metroid in perspective that it's not a big seller in general. So we'll have to see how much the sales drop off in week two, but that's really cool. What's also interesting is we do have sales for Switch OLED because it also launched last week. Uh, and in Japan, we have some exact numbers. It was the number one selling piece of hardware last week. Just, yeah, I'm Switch in general combined sold like 180,000. But the Switch OLED model sold 138,409 units, which that sounds like a lot as the number one spot. However, according to Takahashi Machizuki from Bloomberg, yes, the same guy with all the Switch Pro rumors, um, he said OLED sales in Japan aren't actually as strong as Switch Lights at launch. So it sounds like, hey, you know, Switch Lights sold better, so demand isn't really that great for this platform. But he has a caveat to this. This has been due to supply issues. Switch OLED is sold out entirely in all of Japan, and Nintendo was having a hard time deciding which models to focus production on. Many have been con contacting Nintendo, and this includes investors, um, suggesting slashing the price of the current regular OG version one, version two switch, um, version two switch at this point, um, to clear out inventory and then to just stop making that switch altogether and cut the OLED's price down to $299 and just have it less confusing for marketing and obviously less confusing for production. You can just make the light model and the OLED get rid of everything in between. Um, uh, he does note though that this is probably unlikely to happen at least during the current holiday period which i tend to agree with uh, i don't think nintendo is going to cut a model or price cut anything right now in the middle of or right, right now heading into a holiday period i did know that this is going to be an issue for nintendo in 2022 and i do see the current version 2 switch just being phased out uh, whether or not they actually do a price cut to do that or whether or not they actually price cut the oled model i have no idea but i do at least see the current og model of Switch being phased out in 2022. So I think Nintendo's already planning to do that. It's just obviously right now it is affecting the launch of OLED because they can only make so many units at the factory when you're splitting it between three different models, it can be pretty hard to hit demand for anything. By the way, this doesn't mean that all the Switch OLED data is disappointing. In the UK, Switch OLED massively outsold the Switch Lite. We just don't have exact figures. This is according to several outlets that have access to sales data. They're not allowed to disclose the exact figures, but Switch OLED apparently destroyed Switch Lite sales there. So there is also a case of where Nintendo might not have supplied enough of the supply to Japan versus other territories, preferring to maybe push things more in, you know, Europe and the United States or something. Again, we, don't, we won't have US figures until next month. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Next up, uh, Nintendo actually nuked a bunch of music uploads on YouTube for Pokemon Diamond and Pearl. This isn't surprising when you consider that Diamond and Pearl is coming back out in Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. They did leave Platinum music alone, which suggests none of that music is going to be present in these games. Here's the thing. Um, Nintendo doesn't like when people just do straight music uploads. You can use music uploads as a background to your videos, but you can't just upload them on their own. Nintendo does tend to leave them alone until they're about to release something that's going to use said music. The issue I think here isn't so much that anyone should have a particular problem with Nintendo um, taking out videos that are just direct uploads of music from games. I don't think that is a problem. I know that some people used to get mad about this, you know, when Chugga Conroy and others were negatively impacted, but 
I think the grander issue here is that we are reliant on these uploads to be able to listen to this music outside of the games. Nintendo does not readily make this music, let alone the Pokemon company, which probably has more say in this case, um, allows this music to be heard on Spotify or you know any other service. It doesn't have to be Spotify. There are legal methods Nintendo can use to make all this music available that they just don't take advantage of. So I think this more, so isn't necessarily a knock on Nintendo for using you know their ability to copyright music and get rid of it off of platforms like YouTube. I think everyone is pretty much okay if Nintendo does that so long as there's actually a way to listen to it somewhere else. This is where we obviously get into, hey, you know, when you pirate old games that aren't readily available, people consider that to be morally justified versus new games that are readily available. The problem with this music is it's not readily available. And Nintendo uh, and Pokemon Company, there's just highlights even more that they need to get with the times and actually offer a legal way to listen to this music. And the thing is, if they put it on Spotify, they could even make money off it. So like they're kind of leaving money on the table too. It's so weird, right? I, I don't really understand the logic behind this. Now, Nintendo has released certain albums on iTunes and all that, but we should have a full collection of their music available somewhere, even if it's just iTunes. All right, and this last story is a big one. Again, I thought about splitting this into two separate videos, but bottom line is, um, <laughs> sometimes when I make videos like uh, individuals on this, it gets a little controversy. So maybe keeping this story within the context of other stories um, might help things out. So don't get mad at me. Okay. I'm just, I, some of you are going to get mad at me even bringing this up, but I'll explain why we have new rumors, new reports. Uh, let's call them rumors. These aren't reports, uh, on a 4k switch and not just a 4k switch, a next gen switch, some details on it and how it might be launching as soon as holiday next year if not early 2023, think like March, like they did with the original Switch. Sounds insane considering, hey, you see that thing back there? We just got Switch OLED. So kind of sounds insane to even be talking about this, but uh, let's get into this. So Nate the Hate, Nate Drake, he goes by a few names on the internet, uh, has a podcast he does with MVG. Uh, MVG, Modern Vintage Gamer, is a YouTuber, but before being a YouTuber, he's actually a video game programmer and has accreditation in several projects. So this isn't, you know, the, the Nate the Hate, well, I don't know what his accreditation is. He's obviously has connections with actual developers like Modern Vintage Gamer uh, and has actual sources. In fact, he was one of the only people on the internet during all the Switch Pro rumors to keep touting that there was going to be two models, that we're gonna get some sort of XL OLED model and that there would be an additional more powerful model to come later. Now, um, he got a little, um, conflagulated, is that the word? I don't know, he got a little conflicted, I suppose, around E3 time, because Takahashi Machizuki was so confident in what he was hearing, and it made him start second guessing his sources, and he started to be like, oh, maybe we are gonna get this stuff imminent, and obviously, we didn't get a Switch Pro imminently, but the bottom line is uh, that before being kind of maybe pressured by outside forces, uh, he really felt uh, that there was gonna be two different models, and he was correct on a lot of things. He's been correct on a lot of things. You don't have to trust him. It's fine. This is why it's a rumor. Uh, you don't have to trust Modern Vintage Gamer either. But they both talked about this on a new podcast episode. And my lord, if this stuff is real, damn. So let's get into this. So they said, what is coming from Nintendo no longer sounds like a pro, aka an upgraded current Switch model. Uh, but it sounds like a Switch 2 or a 4K Switch or what you would consider a next generation platform from Nintendo on what they have learned. And it all depends on how the marketing wants to present the product. So the marketing could present the product as it's still part of the current Switch generation. So they are saying that it still could be considered a pro model, but it's going to depend on the marketing. So they might not call this the next gen Switch or a Switch 2. They might prefer to call it a Switch 4K and market this as, hey, it's in the same family. So they aren't saying this is for sure next gen, but it feels next gen for several reasons we're about to get into. Uh, but reality is Nintendo might not market it that way. So, and I did say if they did come out with some sort of pro next year, they wouldn't market it as a next gen platform. Uh, but there are obviously some issues such as backwards compatibility we need to get into. So 
It said, obviously 4K will be achieved through DLSS, which just aligns with every rumor about this platform since the beginning of time. No, I don't think anybody realistically thinks native 4K is happening. Native 4K really isn't much of a thing on PlayStation 5 even. So yes, through DLSS, that makes a lot of sense. We also have Nintendo's own patent that supports the notion that Nintendo is about to use DLSS from Nintendo themselves that they filed 18 months ago. So yeah, it, okay, we, we could say there's actually something behind that DLSS stuff. It doesn't sound like made up bullshit. Moving on, big publishers and developers actually got dev kits in late 2020 or smaller indie ones getting them this year. So dev kits have been out there and we noted that Takahashi Machizuki called out you know, 11 studios that apparently have dev kits he's aware of. And even though one of those studios publicly denied, based on NDAs and other things, they probably have to deny. So bottom line is, it sounds like a bunch of people already have dev kits, all right? Now, data miners have actually suggested that the Switch 4K will have challenges with native backwards compatibility because of hardware differences, because to do get DLSS, they have to use an entirely new infrastructure on the chip level. And that new infrastructure isn't entirely one-to-one -one backwards compatible with the current Tegra X1. However, in the podcast, Modern Vintage Gamer, who is a programmer and a game developer, does suggest that there are options to have backwards compatibility. Now, some of those options include recompiling all of the games, which unfortunately that sort of has to be done by the developers. That can be a bit of a pain in the ass because it's like re-releasing games. There are other options though. Uh, Modern Vintage Gamer doesn't go too deep into what those options are. But he does note that while it is difficult, it is not something that, you know, you just release a new piece of hardware like on PC and everything just still works. There's a lot more work that has to go into it. It's not impossible for a new SOC uh, with new architecture to be backwards compatible with all current Switch games without there really being much of a problem. Um, one of the methods that he does sort of mention it is kind of one of those where most games would be backwards compatible and others would require quick little patch updates. Uh, so that's probably a method Nintendo might explore where it feels like, oh yeah, most of your games just work. And if they don't, you know, there'll be plenty of lead up time for developers to get a, a small little patch ready or something like that. So again, it sounds like backwards compatibility is not off the table uh, and obviously would be needed. And if you have full backwards compatibility, at least based on Nintendo's history, Potentially that means same generation, although 3DS had it. So anyways, let's get into more here. It says the devs are working on exclusives. So there are exclusives in the works for it from third-party developers. However, there's also some PlayStation and Xbox ports in development as well, both from next gen or well, current generation, I guess, PlayStation 5 and Xbox series and last gen. So um, this does look like a system that's gonna be capable of getting current generation ports, which is very, very exciting especially for people worried about an all streaming future for third party games. Cause obviously we're getting more and more streaming games on switch. Well, what if it's only streaming if you're on an OG switch, but you can actually play it natively on this one. That would be a very interesting way to approach full compatibility of games released that might not support the older hardware. So again, I kind of can see a world where they can coexist like that. I hope that is a reality that does happen. So the old people aren't left out, but also, Hey, you want to not be online. You ain't gotta get the new thing. All right, next up, it says devs are targeting their games to be done, at least the, the devs he's talked to, by late 2022. He does note that a game being done doesn't necessarily mean that's when it's going to release for a lot of various reasons, such as the platform isn't out yet. Um, games are often done before a platform comes out. So uh, it's possible that the, the development of a lot of games could be ready to launch by next holiday, but if Nintendo's not ready to launch, they won't obviously launch until the following year. So. Um, but the fact that that's happening does still keep the door open for a 2022 launch. Um, here's that it will release within holiday 2022. So he's here in, you know, basically from October through December, somewhere in there, it would launch, you would assume November, uh, but it could launch in early 2023. So he says either holiday, holiday 2022 or early 2023. So basically October of 2022 until March of 2023, you got like a nice little six month period in there where he's pretty confident that this new hardware, whether it's next gen or Nintendo markets it as a pro model, uh, will come out. And then uh, supply constraints actually make it hard to know exactly when it's possible, meaning it could miss the holiday season. So the idea is Nintendo probably wants it to come out during the holiday, but again, supply constraints. And this kind of goes back to some of the, some of the Takahashi Machizuki talked about in an earlier story about Switch OLED supply in Japan and Nintendo just 
having a hard time figuring out what the hell to focus on. Well, um, if you drop the OG model, you're down to two. That gives you room to start a third production line. Try to get out a bunch of these ready to go for launch. And then by the time you launch this, you maybe you consider dropping the light model or something. Like Switch OLED model is such a vast improvement in handheld that I can see a world where they don't think that cheaper light model matters. Plus the light model is not like, it's like the worst selling Switch right now. Um, it's basically Switch OLED, OG Switch, and then the light model. The light model is the worst selling. I can see a world where they maybe drop that. Remember they did drop the 2DS before the end of the 2DS generation. Then again, they redesigned it as the 2DS XL, but that's neither here nor there. So folks, I actually think this is a very good um, sign. Again, all rumors, I'm not really sure what to believe, but I do think that uh, it's gonna be very, very interesting and that we probably should have a deeper conversation about this on a live stream uh, this week. So either tonight or tomorrow, we will probably have a live stream where we kind of dive deeper into some thoughts and some conversations with all of you on this. Now, if you have any thoughts or opinions on any of our stories today, be sure to hit me back down in the comments. I try to read every single comment um, on my videos. It's been a little crazy lately. I had a tweet blow up on my Twitter yesterday that I definitely did not expect to happen. Um, I think what's interesting is, and, and this is where I need to, you know, just give you a final thank you to everyone is my channel has obviously been seeing a lot of growth over the last, um, you know, few months, uh, really from, from, you know, May until now. And it's, it's reaching a point, uh, of a little bit of critical mass. We're not at a hundred thousand subscribers. We're not getting some crazy 50,000 views a video or something like that. Uh, but we are getting a decent amount of views and to me, this one makes me ex extremely grateful because uh, as sub growth goes and as viewers go, um, it makes me realize that I need to be a bit more careful about some of the things I say sometimes. Uh, not so much that I need to censor myself, but so much that I need to be more considerate. Um, you know, it makes some of the mistakes I've made over the last month, which to me aren't like major ones, but they're still mistakes, um, really stand out even more because obviously the more attention your channel gets, the more of those mistakes are going to be called out and the more it makes you look like an amateur. Bottom line is, folks, I'm just a gamer like the rest of you. I'm I, I'm really no different than you. I'm no better than you. I don't probably know more than you when it comes to gaming. Uh, I'm not an expert, I would say, at really anything in particular. I, I, I'm a parent of three kids, but I wouldn't call myself an expert parent. Um, I've been playing video games for 30 years. I wouldn't consider myself an expert gamer. I've been taking care of dogs for most of my life. I wouldn't consider myself an expert pet owner and trainer. Uh, I've been taking apart electronics for a long time. Wouldn't consider myself an expert in that. Programming for a little while. Wouldn't consider myself an expert in that. I don't know that I'm an expert in anything, but what I consider myself to be is a smidge, a smidge of a jack of all trades, which means I'm just pretty decent at a lot of things. Like any sport I pick up, I'm pretty decent at it. Any game I pick up after a little bit, I get pretty decent at it. Bottom line is, I am pretty decent at this YouTube thing, and I'm aware of that. I'm also aware that I'm not perfect. I'm also aware that now my content isn't for everybody. So for those that are still here, I thank you so much for all the support. You guys are amazing. Um, you guys make me smile every single day. Even some of you guys that are out there chastising me and frustrating me sometimes. It makes me smile as it comes with the territory. I got to learn better how to deal with it. There's people out in my community now that are starting to recognize that I'm a YouTuber, which I'm just not used to. I'm in the middle of a small town in Wisconsin and now people in this town are recognizing who I am. It's a little um, baffling to me. I'm a little bit overwhelmed, I, I suppose, by some of the attention, but it's all a good thing. It's all a positive thing and I'm trying to take it all in stride and not, um, not feel overwhelmed by it because it can be a little overwhelming when you know, I take a break and like, oh, I haven't looked at my phone for the entire 50 minutes I've been recording, which I know the video is not 50 minutes long. And um, I've literally got 723 notifications, some of it from our Discord servers, a bunch of it from Twitter, some of it from YouTube comments. Uh, and then one text from my mom, who's just saying, have a good day. Thank you, mom. So <sighs> you guys are awesome. Thanks so much taking this all in stride. We're growing together. We're figuring this out together. And I think that's what's special about this place and this channel and this community as we're all together. Catch you guys in the next video.